Yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. I'm Benedict and I will be talking about this work, uh, Holistic Security Analysis of Monero Transactions. This is a joint work with my co-authors, Cass Kremers and Julian Loss. We are all at CISPA, Helmholtz Center for Information Security in Germany. And yeah, we looked at the security of Monero transactions and what I want to tell you about today is our work and how it is motivated and what are sort of the takeaways for, for Monero. So let me start with our motivation. Why did we care about this, this problem? Uh, how are we motivated to look at this? Um, yeah, so of course we all know Monero. This is, it's this uh, privacy focused cryptocurrency, the reason why we are all here at this conference. And um, the thing that makes Monero special is the way transactions look like. So they follow this transaction scheme called ring CT and it specifies how you generate transactions, how transactions look like and how you verify them. And now we looked at this and we found that it's a unique composition of, of these cryptographic building blocks, for example, linkable ring signatures or range proofs. And so our, our question was, is this really secure, right? So the, the thing is, if you look at the literature, then there is a security analysis for, let's say, for example, the range proof component, but it's analyzed in a standalone way. And there are standard notions for these kinds of range proofs and the range proofs that are used in Monero, uh, <clears throat> they are proven secure with respect to these notions. But it's not clear that the security of these individual building blocks, such as range proofs, commitments, or ring signatures, implies the security of the entire scheme of Ring CT. Okay, and so our question was, is Ring CT secure? And what are sort of the, the security properties that these components need to satisfy to imply security for the entire transaction scheme? So that was our motivation. And so let me tell you now, sort of uh, at a high level the the um, what we did in our work and then later i will go into detail so the first step of our work was of course to understand how ring ct works right after all this is a complex system and so uh, our first step was really to to look at it and and to learn how it works and while we were doing this we decomposed it into many uh, components that we defined just from a syntactic, uh, syntactical perspective, we defined a set of components. For example, uh, you know, ring signatures, this is already a standard uh, building block, but for example, we also defined some uh, building blocks that are not studied in isolation, like the, the key derivation mechanism that is used in Monero. And so we modularized ring CT into these building blocks. That was the first step. And now that we had a good understanding of Ring CT and how it works, we need to define our goal. What, what is it that we want to show actually? And so we had to come up with a security definition. It's like formally, what does it mean that a scheme like Ring CT is secure? And in our security model, we have an adversary, and this adversary interacts with some idealized ledger and some set of honest parts. And now the guarantees that our security definition gives us are as follows. First, the adversary is not able to steal coins from honest users. And second, the adversary cannot create coins out of thin air. And if this is met, these two conditions are met, then we call the scheme secure. Okay, so I will go more into detail about this security definition later, but there are two things I already want to emphasize. The first is, you see that we use this idealized ledger. So the adversary can take transactions and post them on the ledger, and then if they are valid, they will be stored there. So that means we do not look at consensus protocols that implement these, ledger, these ledgers in, uh, in the reality, right? We just look at the transaction level. How do transactions look like? Uh, how um, are they verified? Okay, and the second aspect that I want to highlight is that this is not about privacy, right? You see in our definition, there are these two guarantees. You cannot steal coins, you cannot create coins, and there's no guarantee about privacy. So we don't look at privacy, although of course, Ring CT is as complex as it is just because you want these kind of privacy features. Okay, 
So now that we had this definitional framework, we had a definition of, of Ring CT and a clear understanding of how it works, and we had a definition of security, we started our analysis. So our goal was to show the security of Ring CT. With a cryptographic security proof, we want to prove Ring CT is secure in our model. Of course, this is a complex system, so you, you're not going to do this in one shot. That's just uh, too much complexity uh, in, in one shot. Instead, we first looked at the components that we defined, and we defined several security notions and properties for all these components. For example, we have security notions uh, for the linkable ring signature scheme in combination with key derivation. And this is something we noticed quite early. If you just analyze the linkable ring signature scheme on its own without taking into account how key derivation works, then this is useless for the security of the entire scheme. Okay, and we defined a lot of these security notions for components or rather for small subsets of these components. And then our first uh, part of the analysis was a system level analysis that shows if you have components, any components that satisfy all of these notions that we defined, then you get a security uh, statement. You, you get the security of Ring CT. So this is our top level or system level analysis. And the second step, of course, was to look at the components. How are they implemented in Monero itself? And do a component level analysis, which means we prove uh, that all of these components, as they are implemented, satisfy all of our notions that we define. Now, in combination, this gives you the security of Ring CT as it is implemented in Monero. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I want to look at three things. First, I want to recall how Ring CT works. Then I will go more into detail about our security model. And then I will give you uh, an overview of one part of this, this proof that we have of our security analysis. Okay, so let me start with Ring CT. Of course, this is a Monero conference, and I assume that you all have an idea of what are the main main uh, ideas and techniques in Ring CT. But I think it's still a good idea to recall how it works, and this will also convey uh, how we looked at it when we were doing our analysis. Okay, so Ring CT is this way of defining transactions, how, how do they look like, how are they verified. And so I should first uh, recall how a transaction in an arbitrary cryptocurrency could look like and how they, they do look like. So the simplest way, or the most simple way of, of, uh, of having a transaction is if the transaction just contains a public key of the sender, an amount, and a public key of the receiver. So this is what I would call a plain transactions. You have that in many cryptocurrencies, for example, in Bitcoin. Uh, in this case, Alice with her public key would just send two coins to Bob. Okay, of course, this is, while it is simple, it is not uh, the best that you could do in, in terms of privacy, because now everyone can publicly link these two public keys. And so you have some kind of linkability here. Okay, so what could you do? You could encrypt your transaction, but then no one can verify that the transaction is correct. And there's, for example, no double spending and things like that. So for that, you would include some kind of zero knowledge proof. And this is uh, a, an approach that is that is followed by, for example, Zcash. Now in Monero, it looks a bit different. We also have this privacy uh, feature, but it is achieved by, by looking at each transactions as sort of a mixer. And you don't really know what is the actual sender public key. Uh, you just know it's one out of this uh, certain anonymity set. Okay, and this is of course what we will look like, what we look at uh, right now. So for that, I first want to start with the simple plain transactions, transactions that look like this. And then I will step-by-step step introduce the ideas of Ring CT that uh, try to, to add some privacy to this. Okay, so let's look at this in a structured way. So a transaction would consist of a sender, an amount, a receiver, and this is very important, a signature that sort of proves that you know the secret key and that sort of proves that you own the coins that you are spending. Okay, 
But this is actually not how it looks like in many currencies. In many currencies, you group together the amount and the receiver into an output. An output is something you can think of it as a coin that you can later spend. And now you, of course, also have an input. An input is just a reference to some previous output that is unspent. And then you prove that you own this input by giving a signature. OK, so in other words, this transaction transforms one unspent output into a new unspent output. And this is what we call the UTXO model. And in some sense, Monero also follows this model. So we will look at one running example to introduce the ideas used in Monero. And in this example, we will have two inputs and one output. And of course, as we have two inputs, we need to have two signatures proving that we own both of the inputs. Okay, this will be our running example, and I will write it like this, making the inputs explicit, but keep in mind, these are just references to previous unspent outputs. So that's our starting point, and now I want to introduce the main ideas of Ring CT and how we add some privacy to this. What do we want to hide? We want to hide everything, right? We want to hide the senders, the mounts, the receivers. To hide senders, we will use ring signatures. To hide amounts, we will use commitments. And to hide receivers, we will use so-called stealth addresses. And this is also what I want to start with. I want to start with hiding the receivers and these so-called stealth addresses. OK, so this is our transaction. And let's now suppose that Alice sends this transaction to the chain and it spends two coins to Bob. OK, so now what we want is that we want the receiver to be hidden. So this public key in the output should be unlinkable to Bob. No one should be able to link this output public key to Bob. And for that, it's first necessary to understand how Bob generates his long-term keys or his address. For that, Bob will pick two random exponents, KV and KS, and it will compute public counterparts of these. So uppercase KV, which is G to the KV, and uppercase KS, which is G to the KS. Now the KS part is what we call a signing or spend key, and it will allow Bob to spend coins that he owns. And the K KV part will be called the view key, as it will allow Bob to identify outputs, outputs like this, that he receives. Okay, and the uh, uppercase counterparts are what, what constitutes his public long-term key or his address. So that means Alice knows this address, KV and KS, the uppercase uh, variants of these. And she will now uh, derive the output public key in the following way. She will sort of perform a Diffie-Hellman key exchange with this KV, and that will give her a shared secret with Bob. And then this secret is used to re-randomize KS. So how does that look in detail? Alice samples a random exponent r and she includes in the transaction g to the r and now if you look at g to the r and kv then you can think of this as a diffie hellman key exchange so what alice will do is she will uh, derive the shared secret the output key as kv to the r and now this is a shared secret with bob she will use it to re-randomize ks and this will be the public key okay so now we should we should uh, believe that the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is secure. And so this KV to the R looks like random to anyone except Alice and Bob. And so this output will look, this output public key will look like a fresh random public key that is not linkable to KS. Okay, but on the other hand, at some point, Bob looks at the ledger and wants to see whether this output is, is his output. And for that, he will derive the shared secret, the output key, using his secret view key and then check whether the re-randomization equation holds. And if it holds, he can derive a secret key uh, just by looking at this equation in the exponent. Okay, and later he can spend this coin using this secret key. So that's how stealth addresses work, and that's how we hide receivers. But one thing I want to emphasize here is that if Alice does this two times, let's say in two transactions or two times within the same transaction, and both keys will have this form, then she knows the difference of Bob's secret keys. Okay, And this is something that you typically don't have in security models for, 
for example, linkable ring signatures. So this kind of knowledge of key relations is non-trivial. And this shows us that the standard notion for linkable ring signatures is just not enough to guarantee that this is still secure. OK, let's now look at, at amounts, right? So uh, we want to hide that Alice is spending two coins to this public key. And for that, we will do a very simple thing. We will just commit uh, to, these, to this amount and include the commitment in the transaction. But of course, there are a lot of problems with this. We will come back to this later. Let's for now just uh, be OK with that, that you just include a commitment. OK. So now this is how our transaction would look like with this, with these commitments. And now I want to hide the inputs. I want to hide that this is really the input of the transaction. Uh, in other words, I want to hide the senders. And for that, I will use ring signatures. How, how is this uh, going to work? We will include some decoys for each of these inputs. So when Alice comes up with this transaction, she will not only include the real inputs, she will also pick some other outputs from the chain. She doesn't need to own them. She just includes them as decoys uh, in the inputs. So here she would include one decoy for this input and two decoys for the other input. And now our ring signature, instead of having a normal signature, we have a ring signature. And this ring signature guarantees that at least one of the inputs was used to sign, but you don't know which one. Okay, so this ring signature gives us this form of ownership proof without revealing which one you actually own. So we, we uh, hide the actual input within the set of decoys. Okay, so that's how you hide inputs. And we already know with stealth addresses how you hide receivers. But there are, okay, so <laughs> I, I forgot that there's an arrow. So these are the decoys. Of course, the color coding here is just for us. This is something you don't see uh, in the real world, right? You cannot distinguish the inputs, the real inputs from the decoys, right? And all of this is just a, a reference, right? OK, so there are two problems that remain and that we have to solve. So the first problem is now that we cannot longer distinguish between actual inputs and decoys, we need some way to prevent double spending or to detect it, right? Because uh, after this transaction appears on chain, the actual input should no longer be spendable because it is already spent. While the decoy, this is something some other party owns. This is something that Alice does not own. And so this should be spendable. OK, and the second challenge is that we have to make sure that the sum of amounts is preserved from inputs to outputs, right? Otherwise, you could create money. And uh, now that all the amounts are in the commitments, it's no longer clear how we how we make sure that you only spend you only have uh, the you only have outputs uh, of value that is as much as the inputs. Okay, so let's start with the first problem and how to detect double spending. And for that, we will use a variant of ring signatures, which is called the linkable ring signature. So in a linkable ring signature, we basically have the same setting as in a ring signature. We have a set of, of uh, public keys. These are our actual inputs and the decoys. And a signature verifies with respect to the set of public keys. But now we have an additional algorithm, link, that tells us whether two signatures were computed with the same public key. OK. And now this algorithm does not tell us which public key was used. It just tells us um, whether the same public key was used. OK, now how can we use this to detect double spending? Well, if Alice spends the same output twice, then she will use the same uh, public key to sign the transaction, or rather the secret key corresponding to that public key. And then this algorithm will output true, so we can detect it. On the other hand, if Alice does not double spend, then with high probability, the keys, which are just re-randomizations of some addresses, are distinct. And so this algorithm will output false. And so this algorithm allows us to detect double spending without identifying the actual input among the decoys. OK, let's look at the second problem and how we um, make sure that amounts are preserved. So this is our transaction again. And what we want to make sure is that the amount in the actual inputs, so the amount 1, 1, which corresponds to this commitment 1, 1, 
plus amount to two corresponding to commitment to two is the same as the output uh, amount, the amount committed to in this output. Okay, this is what we want to make sure. Otherwise, you could create money and sort of the sender wants, so Alice wants to prove that to everyone else. Okay, how could we do that? Well, let's look at how a commitment looks like. A commitment is just a Peterson commitment. So that's G to some commitment randomness times H to the amount. Okay, and this has some nice homomorphic features. We can just check this equation over the commitments. Okay, if you look at this equation, that's something you can publicly check. And if you expand the terms, then you can see if the sum of amounts uh, is preserved and you choose the commitment randomness uh, CR for the output commitment appropriately, then this equation works out and you can sort of prove just by looking at or, or verify just by looking at uh, the commitments that the sum of amounts is preserved. Okay, that sounds, sounds cool, but it doesn't really work, right? It introduces a way to in distinguish real from decoy inputs, right? Because now this equation will hold for the real inputs, but for the decoys, it's very unlikely that this equation holds, right? After all, you just pick the decoys in an arbitrary way from the, from the chain. You don't know anything about it. Alice doesn't even own them. So she does not know uh, what the amounts are. And so this equation will only hold for the real inputs not for the decoy inputs. It allows us to distinguish them and defeats the entire purpose of using ring signatures. Okay, so how can we solve this? And here I, I like to quote some famous computer scientist, David Wheeler. He says, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. And I feel that the Monero developers uh, all also use this idea here. So what we will do is we will introduce another layer that we call pseudo outputs. A pseudo output is just a commitment and you have one of them for each of the inputs. So here we have two inputs, both with their decoys. So we have two pseudo outputs, okay? And now we will check that the, the amounts are preserved from pseudo outputs to outputs using our homomorphic equation. This does not reveal anything about what are the actual inputs, right? Because until now the pseudo outputs are hidden or no, they are independent from the inputs. Okay, so how do we make sure that the amounts are preserved from inputs to pseudo outputs? This is now something we can do um, for each input separately. So what do we want to prove here? We want to prove that one of the inputs, either the COM11 or COM12, has the same amount as this COM1, okay? And we want to show this without revealing which one it is. And this is actually the same problem uh, that is solved by using a ring signature, right? So you can just in, in, uh, include this check uh, as a second dimension in your ring signature. I won't go into detail about this uh, here. Okay, so let me summarize how transactions look like by telling you how we verify them. So this is our transactions now. Uh, transaction now, how do we verify that it's correct? The first thing we have to check is all inputs uh, in this case, five of them, right, are previous outputs, okay? The second thing that you have to check is that all signatures are valid. This proves ownership of the actual input, and it also proves that the amounts are preserved from inputs to pseudo outputs. Then you should make sure that there is no double spending by checking that none of the signatures links to a previous signature, and they also don't link to each other, because if it links, we know there is a, a double spending. Okay, and then the final thing you check is that the amounts are preserved from pseudo outputs to outputs using this homomorphic uh, check. Okay, so this is how transactions look like. This is ring CT. Now that we know what we are analyzing, we know how ring CT works, let me tell you what our goal was. In other words, let me tell you what was the security definition uh, that we aim for and what was the statement that we want to prove about Ring City. Okay, so typically when you define a security model in cryptography, you do two things. You first specify what can the adversary do, what are the capabilities of the adversary, of a realistic adversary, and then you say what are the goals of the, the adversary. 
Okay, so let's start with the capabilities. What can the adversary do in our model? We have the adversary, and as I said in the beginning of the talk, we have a ledger and we have some set of honest parties. Now the adversary can create new honest users, right? I don't want to specify how many users, how many honest users are there, uh, but the adversary can just go to the security game and say, please give me a new honest user, right? Let's say he says, please give me a new honest user, Bob, and a new honest user, Alice. Whenever he does this, these users will generate their long-term keys, honestly, and then tell them the public signing key and the secret view key. And the idea is that the scheme should be secure. You should not be able to steal money from anyone, even if you know their view key. The purpose of the view key is just to uh, make sure that you cannot identify them. So this is just for privacy. And we, talk, we are talking about security, so you should learn the view key. OK. Now the adversary should, of course, be able to submit transactions to this ledger so he can come up with transactions however he wants to. And now this transaction is verified with respect to the rules that I just showed you uh, a few slides ago. And if it is valid, then it is added to the ledger. Now, of course, the honest user should also submit transactions. And here we allow the adversary to specify what they how the transactions should look like in a sense that he can specify the sender, the receiver, and the amount. So he may go to Alice and say, please spend 10 Monero to Bob. OK, now what we also allow the, the adversary, but I won't uh, consider this for the rest of the talk, is that he corrupts users by learning their secret signing key. And what is really, really important is we need some initial money supply for the system, right? Because I said a transaction is only valid if it spends outputs of previous transactions. So by that rule, there can no, if I start with no transaction, I cannot even add a first transaction, right? There's nothing uh, to spend. So I need some uh, source coins, some initial money supply, which would correspond to mining in the in the real world so the adversary could go to the security game and say please uh, give me new source coins uh, that i can then use in my transactions okay so that's what the adversary can do now let's see what the adversary wants to do and uh, we have two winning conditions sort of for the adversary so the first winning condition is that the adversary steals coins the second winning condition is that he creates coins and so that means if a scheme is secure in our model then we can guarantee that no adversary will be able to steal coins and no adversary will be able to create coins. Okay, let's look at these winning conditions uh, in a bit more detail. What does stealing mean in this context? So let's say we have the adversary and we have some honest user, Alice. And now the adversary instructs Alice to send 10 coins to Bob. Now maybe Alice owns 10 coins, so she has 10 unspent coins that she got from some previous transactions. And now she generates the transaction honestly, submits it to the ledger. And now we say that the adversary steals coins if this transaction is rejected. And then the adversary wins the, the security game and breaks the security of our scheme. So how do we interpret this? Let's say Alice has 10 unspent coins. She thinks she has them. And now she is not able to spend them because her transaction is rejected. Well, that means the adversary either stole them or he somehow managed to destroy them in some way. Okay, so this should be something that is not possible. Okay, let's look at the second winning condition. What does it mean to create coins? How do we formalize this and model it in our uh, definition? So we will have a variable received that just measures how, how many coins did the adversary receive throughout the game. Okay, so we could look at the adversary whenever it goes to the game and says, please give me a new source coin of value C, and we increase this uh, variable, or if he corrupts a user that owns C coins, or if he asks a user to spend, to sign a transaction that um, spends C coins to the adversary, in all of these cases, the adversary gets C coins, so we increase our variable. OK, we will have a, another variable, which is spent, and it measures how many coins did the adversary spend throughout the game. So when the adversary submits a transaction to the chain that spends C coins to an honest user, 
uh, then we will increase this. Okay, and now what does it mean to create coins? Well, if at any point in time, this variable spent is larger than received, then this means the adversary spent more coins than he ever received. Okay, so that means he must have created some coins. Okay, in this case, the adversary wins, we say the adversary creates coins. Okay, so this is our security model. This, this was the overview of, of what we want to prove. And now I want to look at some part of the proof that I find particularly interesting. And I think this is also applicable in other, for other currencies or for new schemes, new, uh, new constructions. So we will look at our security analysis. And this is again the, the picture that we saw in the beginning. Our security analysis contains two parts. The first is this system level analysis where we assume security of components and show that the entire scheme is secure without looking into the implementation of these components. And then our second part is, is proving that the components as implemented in Monero satisfy all of our notions. So now in this overview, I only want to focus on this top level part where we assume that components, for example, these ring signatures or the commitments and so on, satisfy certain security notions and then we we prove security of the entire scheme in the model that i just introduced okay so we want to prove the adversary cannot steal coins the adversary cannot create coins these are our two winning conditions and i want to focus on the second winning condition okay so the part of the proof that we will look at now is the second winning condition assuming um security of the building blocks. Okay, so how can we show the adversary cannot spend more than he received? And for that, we will look at one running example. And at this example, I want to uh, illustrate our proof. So we will have four source coins, uh, four source outputs. The adversary went to the game and said, please give me these uh, four sources. And then the adversary maybe add, added a transaction to the, to the ledger with two inputs, both with one decoy and three outputs. Okay, and then maybe there was a second transaction uh, by some honest user Alice, and it spends uh, one input into one output, and this one input has three, uh, has two decoys. Okay, so that's that's our setting. And now let me tell you how we prove that the adversary cannot create coins here. Okay, so first of all, if we look at this, we don't see much, right? Because everything is hidden inside commitments and there are these decoys. And so it's really hard to argue that there is no money that is created. We first need to uh, shed some light on, on what is going on here. Okay, so that will be our first step. We want to extract the amounts from all the commitments. Okay, so let's say we have the second transaction, then this is added by an honest user. So the security game really knows the amounts. So we can we can talk about them and, and write them next to our commitments. And we do that both for outputs, but also for pseudo outputs. And then there's this other transaction. This is a bit more tricky. We also extract the amounts and also the commitment randomness for all outputs and all pseudo outputs. We also do that for all the sources. Okay, now you may ask, how can we do that? And this is the first, the first time where we assume a security notion for the underlying building blocks. In this case, the commitments in combination with the range proof. And what we use is some kind of knowledge soundness, which is a typical uh, security notion in cryptography that gives you an extractor in the proof, uh, allowing to extract. Of course, you don't have this extractor in the real world because you want privacy here, right? You, it should not be possible to extract the amounts from the commitments, but in the security proof, it is possible uh, through a notion that is called knowledge extraction. Okay, so here we already assume security of the, of the building blocks, and now we have a much better picture of what, what is actually going on here. But there's still something that is annoying, namely these decoys, right? We still don't know what are the actual inputs and what are the decoys. So that will be our second step 
we will use again some knowledge extraction uh, like security notion that we define for the ring signatures in combination with key derivation and that will allow us to eliminate a lot of these edges okay so now again we use the security notion of some underlying building block in this case the signatures and it allows us to extract what are the actual inputs in the proof okay so this will give us this kind of picture and now we really see what's going on and we can translate this into some combinatorial structure in this case a directed graph okay so you will have one vertex for each output and one vertex for each transaction. So in this case, we have these four source outputs. Then we have the three outputs of transaction one and one output of transaction two. And we will have the two vertices representing transaction one and two. And you uh, add an edge whenever you had an edge in, in this picture, right? So whenever uh, some output is the real input of a transaction, you add an edge, or whether some when some output is the output of a transaction, you also add an edge. Okay, so we just transformed this into a directed graph, and now we will look at this graph and argue that the adversary cannot uh, create coins here. Okay, so this is our graph. The first thing I want to do is I want to extend it uh, in various ways. So first we will add some dedicated artificial vertices S and T. S will sort of correspond to the source of money. So we will, we will uh, connect S to all the source outputs. So in our case, we had four source outputs. We will add an edge from S to these outputs. And now what about T? Well, we will look at all the outputs and consider outputs that don't have an outgoing edge yet. Right. Intuitively, that's the outputs that are not spent yet, right? So, for example, the two uh, upper uh, outputs of transaction one, uh, but not the, the third output of transaction one, right? For all of these, we will add an edge to T, okay? So that's our new graph now, okay? And now we will label this graph. We will label the edges of the graph with the amounts that we extracted before. Right? Recall that for each output, for example, this one, we extracted a, an amount uh, and we will label all edges incident to that output vertex with the amount that we extracted. Okay, So we'll do that for all the outputs. Here there are the three outputs of transaction one and the, two output, uh, the one output of transaction two. Okay, now we have this, this graph and we want to argue about these amounts we want to argue the adversary cannot create money how do we do that well for that we will first recall some combinatorial theory the theory of network flows what is a flow network a flow network is just a directed graph with some dedicated vertices s and t the source and the sink and we have this additional condition that whenever you look at a vertex that is not s or t then whatever goes into the vertex is equal to whatever goes out to the vertex, right? So look at this uh, upper vertex here uh, on the top right. There we have two units of flow going in and one plus one unit of flow going out. So whatever is going in is also going out. Now, if we have such a graph, we can define a so-called ST cut, which is just a partition of the vertices into two sets where one of the sets contains S and the other one contains T. Now there's a, a fact about or a lemma about these cuts, which says that if you fix a flow network, then every ST cut has the same value. And the value is defined as the net flow going from S to T. So let's look at a few examples to understand this here. So we could, for example, just put T into one partition, blue one here, and put every every vertex, every other vertex into the uh, black partition. Now the value would be everything going from black to blue. So that's one plus two, so three units of flow, minus everything that is going back. In our case, there's nothing going back from blue to black. And so the value would be three. Now look, let's look at a different cut. We could put... Uh, the three leftmost vertices into the partition in containing S. 
and the other ones into the partition containing T. Now we have a value, which is everything from blue to black. So that's two plus two, that's four, minus everything that is going back from black to blue. So that's one. So we subtract one and we get again a value of three. Now let's look at one final example. We just switched the roles of these uh, upper vertices. And now whatever goes from blue to black is one plus one plus two plus one, that's five, minus everything that is going back from black to blue. So that's two. Uh, and again, our value is three. So I hope you have now, uh, you're confident that this lemma really holds. And it's in fact not, not hard to show that this holds. Now, why, uh, why are we talking about this? Well, we have our graph that we extracted from the, the state of the, of the transaction system. And now what I want to argue is that this is a flow network and I want to then use this lemma to finish my proof. Okay, so my next step would be to argue that this is a flow network. What do I have to argue for that? Well, I have to argue that at every vertex, except S and T, the amount going in is preserved. The amount going in is the same as the amount going out. Okay, now let's look at these uh, vertices. We have, of course, we have output vertices. So for example, the source vertices here or the outputs of transaction one. Now for them, if we want to argue that everything going in is equal to what is going out, the only thing that we have to argue just by construction is, is that there is no vertex for which we have two outgoing edges or more than two, right? And so this is where we use the, the fact that there is no double spending. So we use the linkability of this linkable ring signature and again, we need to define some new notion that tells us that there is sort of no, no uh, vertex with um, two outgoing edges. And this is, again, a notion that we define for the uh, components. In this case, the linkable ring signature, again, in combination with key derivation. OK, so now what about the other vertices, the transaction vertices? They are a bit more complicated. Here we have to argue that whatever is going in uh, in this case, amount one plus amount three is equal to what is going out. Okay. And of course, here we again need to use the security notions of underlying building blocks. And if you recall the constructions, we use this homomorphic check of the commitment. And we also use the ring signature uh, to show that amounts are preserved from inputs to pseudo outputs and then from pseudo outputs to outputs. And uh, to argue this here, we again use some underlying notions, for example, binding of this commitment scheme. Okay, let's say we, we are able to do this and now we are sure that this is a flow network. Now we want to use the lemma that every ST cut in this flow network has the same value. Okay, we will define one specific ST cut that we are interested in now, okay? And the idea is, okay, I want to argue about this, these two variables, spend and received, whatever the adversary spend and what he received. Now, I want to map this sort of to the value of a specific cut. And if I want to do this, then a natural thing to do is to put all the honest, the honestly controlled vertices into one partition and everything else, which is potentially controlled by the adversary into the other one. So for example, this first transaction TX1, if we recall, this was added by the adversary. So we put it into the red partition. And uh, let's say this first source, uh, source coin or source uh, output, let's say it was also owned by the adversary or rather not owned by an honest user, then we also put it into the red partition. And everything that is controlled uh, or owned by an honest user every output and also every transaction added by an honest user will be put into the honest partition into the gray one. We will also put S into the gray partition and T into the red partition. Okay, so this is our ST cut. And now we will analyze the value of this cut to finish our proof. Okay, so what is the value? We have to look at everything that goes from gray to red. So edges like this minus everything that goes back from red to gray. Okay, so let's start with whatever goes from malicious to honest, so from red to gray. If you think about this, then whenever we added an edge here from red to gray, 
this means that some amount of, of, of money is, is uh, going from the adversary to an honest user. So we can argue that this is at least the variable spent. Okay, and similarly, we can look at whatever is going from honest to malicious, so from gray to red. And we can argue that this is at most received, but there's, there's also some additional uh, some contributing here, and this is whenever you have an honestly controlled output that is uh, adjacent to T, right? So for example, this output, the second output of transaction one uh, contributes to the sum going from gray to T, okay? So this is the second sum here. Now, if we want to look at the value of the cut, we can just subtract these two uh, inequalities from each other and we get that the value of the cut is at most this sum going from gray into t plus received minus spent. Okay, good. Now we have the value of the cut and we want to use our lemma that every cut in this flow network has the same value. Okay, so this is the value of the cut hm that we defined and we will look at the second cut, which is the cut uh, that is just given by putting T into one partition and everything else into the other one. And by this lemma, the two values are equal. And if you look at the definition of the value and use it to compute the value of this uh, T, this cut that has T in a singleton set, then we can lower bound this by all edges going from gray into T, right? The value uh, here is just everything that goes into T and so this is, of course, uh, at least whatever goes from gray into T, okay? So now if we look at this inequality that we derived, we see that we can subtract this ugly sum that we have, and we see that received is at least spent, okay? What does that tell us? It tells us that whenever, whatever the adversary does, we will always have this inequality, and that means the adversary cannot uh, create coins. He cannot spend more than he ever received. Okay, so that's the proof uh, sketch, right? Um, of course, this is just a sketch. and There are a lot of details you have to consider here. For example, I did not talk about how to model corruptions in this kind of uh, graph. And this is uh, one aspect that is, is a bit tricky. Okay, let me summarize what we have seen in this talk. So first, uh, I explained uh, why we looked at this and what is Ring CT. I recalled how, how the ring CT construction works, how transactions look like. And then I explained what our security model is and what the thing is that we are proving, right? We are proving the adversary cannot steal coins, he cannot uh, create coins. And then finally, I gave you an idea of how our proof worked and it used this uh, elegant theory of, of network flows. And I, I think that you can apply this theory in of network flows in other currencies as well. And you just uh, have to get to the point where you can argue that this is a, a flow network. Right? Okay, so with that, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or also by it. Uh, yeah, thank you.